All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, again, for those who joined a little bit late, my name is Kent Mitchell. I'm the Senior Director of State Affairs for the National Head Start Association. Uh, and I'm so thrilled to be with uh, you here all today on a little bit of a mini event, but a wonderful celebration um, of renewed vision for Early Head Start in Maryland and New Jersey and New York. I'm so excited to be joined by state association leaders from those three states who have been working hard with parents, program directors, and others to develop a vision, right, for Early Head Start, Early Head Start Child Care Partnerships, uh, and all the amazing services and supports they provide to pregnant women, infants, toddlers, and their families. Um, so again, welcome here today to learn more about uh, what they've decided uh, should be in the vision there and, and re this uh, mini release uh, event. Uh, Lucy, if we could go to the next slide, please. So NHSA's vision, for those who don't know us, right, we are the untiring voice for the Head Start community, for, for all vulnerable children, families, and those uh, who work so hard on their behalf every day in Head Start. Um, and we advocate. We advocate for policy changes that will ensure all vulnerable children and families have what they need to succeed. Next slide. And that's our mission. Our mission is to coalesce, inspire, and support the Head Start field as a leader in early childhood development and education. It's my honor to work with great colleagues like the ones you'll talk to today in advance of that mission. Next slide. So we all know if you're here, you probably know quite a bit about early Head Start, uh, an extension of the Head Start model for pregnant women, infants, and toddlers. But to clarify again, for those who may be less familiar in joining us today, um, it's a proven evidence-based model that centers families, that's really tailored to the unique needs of infants and toddlers and pregnant women, that promotes holistic child development, physical, cognitive, social, health, emotional development, and it assists families in meeting their own goals and self-sufficiency. And finally, programs mobilize the local community. We know so many of our neighbors, our friends, our fellow organizations care about young children and families, and partnerships with them is critical to the Early Head Start support model. Next slide. It's a flexible model, right? For those who are, again, less, a little less familiar, Early Head Start has a wide range of options that allows it to serve the unique needs and context in which it exists. From center-based care to child care partnerships, home visiting, tribal, migrant, and seasonal programming, and prenatal support and postpartum support as well. Next slide. 25 years of evidence, 25 years of evidence shows early Head Start changes lives. It's a great investment. These are just some of the key takeaways and measurable impacts in healthcare, improved behavior, behavior, cognitive development and parental support. And the one I really like to point out is that positive parent-child relationship, how it brings support, stability and connection into the home uh, and creates that, that stable bond or it strengthens that, that bond that children need so much as they grow, develop and age. Next slide. So here's just a little bit of early Head Start by the numbers. We do have a facts and figure sheet we'll send later after the call, and you can check these, uh, this data out as well. Um, these are some of the program types, like I said, percent of children served in different programs. You'll see, again, the diversity of programs early Head Start can operate within. Uh, and you'll also see that the program served 240,000 children in the last year. Uh, and so a great, a great example of how this program is fundamental, foundational, uh, to the success of so many communities uh, and in our country. Next slide. That said, head, early Head Start reaches only a fraction of eligible families. Between 10 and 11% of eligible children have access. Um, and that's something we're working really hard to change through state policy, federal policy, funding, and many other avenues. Next slide. So early Head Start growth has been steady. That's a good part of the story here. You'll see this is just congressional funding, uh, which has gone up steadily over time, but it's been far too incremental to reach the numbers of children uh, that we need to reach. Um, so we know the solution needs to be multifaceted again. Congress, program decisions, state decisions, communities coming together, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Next slide. At-risk children and families, I think this is fundamental to why early Head Start needs to grow. Head Start has been an amazing success story uh, for over 55 years, I believe, early Head Start for over 25, yet we don't have a true prenatal to five continuum. In too many communities, in too many programs, 
if you don't get into early Head Start as, a, as an infant, you're never getting in. There just simply aren't enough slots to meet the need and meet the demand. We want to close the gap between the number of early Head Start slots and Head Start slots by rising the number of available seats. Um, so more children can access this game-changing uh, support. Next slide. So that's what Early Head Start Rising is all about. Early Head Start Rising is our campaign at NHSA to elevate these issues and to push for a major expansion of the Early Head Start model to 500,000 additional children. So let's learn a little bit more about that before we dig into our state work today. So Early Head Start Rising really see, is an equity-driven initiative. It really seeks to address those broad inequities that can start at birth. Millions of infants and babies live in poverty, uh, and we know COVID has had a huge impact on families as well. There's a historic systemic lack of family-based support that has kept parents, especially mothers, out of the workforce. And Early Head Start is a solution. It helps families navigate critical services, especially health services, which may be lacking in their neighborhoods and communities. I wanna go back to that core point though, again, the need is much greater than Early Head Start's current capacity. And again, that's what we're here trying to drive today with these agendas and with Early Head Start Rising, access for more children who are eligible for this amazing program. Next slide. So Early Head Start Rising has three components, raising awareness, building a stronger community of practice, and engaging in federal, national, state, and local advocacy and policymaker engagement all of these are going to be critical to growing uh, access to Early Head Start and the Early Head Start model. Next slide. And states are key actors, right? At least nine states directly invest in Early Head Start. Kansas, for example, has long invested in child care partnerships and home visiting through the federal funding through Kansas Early Head Start. Washington State's Early ECAP program standards are modeled on Early Head Start. And multiple states, including Colorado, Connecticut, New Hampshire, have taken advantage of recent COVID relief funding to invest in the program as well. We're thrilled by all this level of state support, but we have a long way to go. So that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, so we're going to pivot away from the slides and start our discussion uh, with our three states who have done so much to get to this point uh, to develop policy agendas and policy statements around early Head Start. So I wanna start by introducing uh, our three panelists today. I'll keep the intros brief. Uh, panelists, feel free to add anything else you wanna add or say hello in the chat. Uh, Bonnie Egenberg is the president of the New Jersey er uh, Head Start Association. Welcome Bonnie today. Uh, Carolyn Wiggins is the president of the New York Head Start Association. Carolyn, welcome as well. And then Simeon Russell is the executive officer of the Maryland Head Start Association. So please join me in the chat and welcoming them today. I'm so glad you guys are all here to share more about your policy agendas. And I wanna really key in as we start this Q&A today with you all and unveil these agendas about the need, right? I mean, this is all about why do an agenda, right? Why push for expanded access? Wanna learn from each of you, what is the current need for early Head Start in your state? You all represent programs on the ground. Some of you uh, on the call here run programs yourselves. What are you seeing in your state? Um, so, Bonnie, I wonder if you could kick us off and talk, talk to us about the landscape in New Jersey. What do you see? Why is Early Head Start so needed uh, in New Jersey? Thank you, Kent. Uh, early Head Start really provides that um, early foundation. If we can get children in when their mothers are pregnant with them, um, then we, we're getting children off to a good start. In New Jersey, we serve about 16,000 children per year um, and only about 4,000 for early Head Start. So there's a huge difference in the number of uh, children we're serving through early Head Start than we are through Head Start. And you already mentioned the continuity issue. There, there is that inability to see children through that birth to five, range because of the inequity of number of seats. Um, so that is, that's a major concern, but part of what has been an issue for expanding early Head Start in the state of New Jersey, one obviously is, is the lack of funding, but the other piece is that we have a workforce issue. Uh, we want to have high quality, at minimum, infant toddler CDA trained 
teachers in the classroom. And there just aren't any. People don't go to school to become infant toddler teachers here in New Jersey. And I would imagine other states also have that, that issue. Thank you so much, Bonnie, for that overview. I wanna to turn to Simeon next. Simeon, can you talk about the need for Early Head Start in Maryland? What are you seeing on the ground? And your state is interesting because you have state funding for Head Start already, and now you're looking to branch out to Early Head Start. So what's the need like in Maryland? Yeah, so we do, uh, and, and thank you, Kent, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, we do have some state supplemental funding uh, for Head Start, and it does expand into Early Head Start, uh, but we don't have enough slots for Early Head Start in the state of Maryland. Right now we have about 1,800 slots for Early Head Start, and we want to expand the number of those slots uh, because in the state of Maryland, about 51% of our residents live in childcare deserts, especially mm -hmm. in rural neighborhoods like Western Maryland and, and maybe even uh, down near uh, Eastern Shore. You know, uh, so we want to bring the model that we find in Early Head Start to impact those neighborhoods, those lower income neighborhoods uh, where, you know, pregnant women. Uh, and young children may not have the resources available, you know, and, and we know that Early Head Start uh, brings those resources and, uh, you know, brings the support for those women and children that are necessary. So that's our goal, really, to help alleviate these child care deserts within the state of Maryland. And Early Head Start, um, you know, provides uh, the, the, the foundation that is needed uh, to help alleviate those deserts as well as provide uh, the proper foundation for women, children, and families. So, and that, Thank you so much. Thank you. And for anyone who's been to Maryland, you know how uh, different, uh, you know, Baltimore can be from Eastern Shore and other areas and, and also cut off by different waterways. So there's a lot of variation in the state. And I think you're speaking really, really well to that and the need for high quality infant toddler care, prenatal care everywhere uh, in your state. Um, so I'm going to go to Carolyn now, who's uh, coming to us from New York City. And Carolyn, can you talk about the need for Early Head Start where you are? Um, yes, I can. Um, there's really a need, as Bonnie has stated, um, for Early Head Start. And one of the issues, several issues that are facing New York State facilities issues, the cost per child, and the workforce um, issue of finding qualified um, applicants to want to work with infants and toddlers. And especially in New York City, there's an additional qualification that you have to have if you're going to be a two-year-old teacher, you must be certified um, by the state of New York. That's only for New York City, so that's an additional requirement. So it, it presents a real host of issues across New York State and um, getting qualified workforce and salaries is an issue and really facilities because the cost per square footage is outrageous, especially in New York City. And it's going up and well in the state as well. But um, I, I just have a real, um, we, look at, we are looking in New York State at the Early Head Start Child Care Partnership model I, I have a real affinity for that because back in the 70s, I worked with uh, a group of providers throughout New York City, and I saw that they were really interested in providing quality services. So with the Early Head Start Child Care Partnership, it does elevate the um, child care situation where in the partnership, the providers are providing um, assessments with the children, the children are receiving early intervention. Um, they have a evidence-based curriculum that, that is being used and the homes are monitored. And so that is one way that we can have more of an input into the early Head Start arena in New York State is to really um, increase the partnership. And it works as well also with the center-based programs because we have a few um, center-based daycare programs that's involved in our partnerships throughout the state, and they receive the additional assistance 
which elevates the um, quality of services that we have provided in the state of New York. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for walking us through that. And I actually want to let's continue to talk about child care partnerships for our panelists. We're going to go right to child care partnerships, keep talking about that. Um, Simeon, that's one of the three planks in your agenda. And I think one of your goals with your agenda is to get the state to play a more active role in kind of facilitating partnerships, et cetera. You know, why is that important? Uh, why is that important to your members, to early Head Start programs, and to the child care community? Well, you know, we want to increase those child care partnerships. Right now, we have a limited number of child care, EHS child care partnerships, and we would like to increase them, uh, one, because we believe, you know, it, it benefits child care, you know, in the state of Maryland, especially after the pandemic, you know, child care programs were hit pretty hard. And, and, you know, we feel, you know, we, in Maryland, you know, we try not to operate in silos as much as possible and, and really band together uh, to promote and advocate for early child care, child care across the state, you know, so child care programs were really hit pretty hard. Uh, if we can increase our number of, uh, early Head Start child care partnerships, mm -hmm. it can help Head Start and the ability to find affordable and licensable, uh, space for our early Head Start programs. And it can also help child care programs, uh, to get back on their feet. Now, um, but one of the areas that where we're really focusing is training though, Ken. Um, you know, we wanna make sure that those childcare programs that are interested in partnerships really understand what it is, what Head Start is, uh, what the partnership entails, what the requirements, that's been one of the barriers and us really expanding that program. You know, so we're really, working with the state to develop a, 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 a training program or training program, I guess, uh, to really help those child care, child cares understand uh, Head Start standards, staffing, fiscal, et cetera. You know, uh, so that's really a, um, a goal of ours, to, with, you know, with the state and, and, you know, with funding that may come from the state, uh, we're asking for the state's help in educating child care programs, as well as, you know, providing funding, you know, to help those partnerships grow. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I call it almost like the brokering function. And mm -hmm. uh, like you said, the training function, um, if we're going to reach significant scale where the EHS model is really embedded in far more settings and reaches more children, we believe states are going to have to play a more active role uh, in that. Um, and they should have good reason to do that, right? Because the model is so effective and can provide stability to, like you said, a very hard hit child care community and child care sector who needs support as well. Yeah. Um, Bonnie, how about early childhood child care partnerships in your state? Um, uh, does your program do that? Do uh, other members of yours do it? And what does it look like in New Jersey? So we do have early Head Start child care partnerships throughout New Jersey, uh, some up north, um, some down here in the southern area. Um, and my program is one of them that has it. Uh, we, in our program, took two approaches to the Early Head Start Child Care Partnership process. And that was one to establish our own child care centers and then braid Early Head Start funding with child care within those centers, mm -hmm. as well as to partner with centers that were already established and uh, really raise them up and provide that training and technical assistance so that their teachers uh, were infant toddler CDA um, credentialed and that they were fully embracing the early Head Start approach to providing infant toddler care. Um, we also worked very closely with Suzanne Burnett, our State Head Start Collaboration Director to help us partner with the state to make sure that families that were applying for early Head Start quickly could get through the voucher process, get approved and get that child care subsidy. And we also um, worked with them as well as ACNJ to really push forward the need to increase the subsidy rates so that we could do a better job of sustaining high quality. 
It's wonderful. So you're really, I mean, that's taking that whole big picture of you, right? Child care, Head Start, Early Head Start, all coming together to better serve infants, toddlers, and pregnant women. So great to hear that. I want to continue on the workforce front, actually, that you brought up. And I, I'm wondering if Suzanne, if you'd be willing to jump in here too. Suzanne has been a wonderful collab director and partner in New Jersey um, and is a passionate advocate for infant toddler uh, credentialing and support, more compensation for the field. So Suzanne, maybe you could update folks on what you're working on because that's embedded in the agenda of the association as well. Um, so one of the things that, um, that we're trying to do at the state level um, is to recognize infant and toddler teachers. Um, they are professionals um, and we need to treat them as such. So um, we, a couple of years ago, I formed a committee with Head Start, uh, the Office of Child Care, um, and with community colleges to look at how we can get the infant and toddler certification done at the Department of Education. Um, a lot of the community colleges felt as though that if that certification came through the Department of Education, there would be more of a drive for people to um, go into that field because they could get that certification from the Department of Education. Um, we did hit a glitch. Um, I did, we worked on the code um, to get this through. Um, but one of the things that they said that it was not mandated by the Office of Head Start uh, to have a two, a 18 credit hour um, college credit to get that two year degree, or they could use the 18 credit hours with their bachelor's degree or their master's degree. That was not a requirement. Um, so what we did, um, I want you to know, I've been turned down twice, but I keep going back. Mm -hmm. And so now we're going to, <laughs> we're going to go back and um, I'm working with um, the state office of child care licensing, um, Department of Labor and DOE to see if we could put it in licensing regs uh, just uh, for 18 to put the 18 credit hours in and as well as in the state QIS system. Um, and so therefore, um, that would be a part of the regulation. Um, and that would help drive that certification through the department. But one thing is for sure, we've got to push the salaries, we cannot ask for this 18 credit college credit hours for infinite toddler teachers and only pay them $15 an hour or less. So it has to go hand in hand. Um, the Office of Head Start, I'm sorry, the Office of Child Care is doing a great job in using some of their subsidy money to increase infinite toddler care in the state of New Jersey. Uh, we're hoping that um, this would also help uh, increase the salaries for infinite toddler teachers if you accept subsidies. So we're doing two things at one time. So well, we need to make a huge push everywhere. You know, Build Back Better federally may not be moving forward. We're really not sure. Um, but a huge component of that that NHSA and partners were advocating for was uh, $2.5 billion a year for the early Head Start and Head Start workforce to invest in their compensation, their benefits, uh, to make sure they can really build a career uh, uh, around the work that they love and the children and families they love. So I commend you for always being a leader on this and we'll continue to be in that fight with you. I wanna go to Carolyn too. I mean, we're really, workforce is frankly, probably the number one issue uh, right now facing Head Start and early Head Start. Carolyn, what's it like on the ground for you? What are the challenges you're facing? Uh, would love to hear a little more from your perspective. You're on mute right now. Right, sorry. I apologize for that. New York State um, is really like two states. Um, in New York City, we have a real challenge with the workforce because of the requirements that um, infants and toddlers and even teachers have to have um, to maintain, to be in a program and for the center, we're talking about center base now, to maintain a, a permit to operate. 
So say if you have a license from two to five, two years to five years of age, you must have a certified educational director. They want all of your teachers to be certified or on a study plan for ages two to five. And if you have an infant and toddler program, this is only in New York City, I'm talking about now, you must have an educational director as well who is New York State certified. So, and then the teachers will have all different kinds of things, at least a bachelor's um, a degree in an educational or related field. So it is really difficult to get that workforce. Um, most teachers do not want to go into this arena of education, getting a B through two certification. So that's one of the requirements. So in New York State is a little different. Um, I believe our Patty Purcell is on the um, call uh, with the, um, she's our New York State Head Start Collaboration Director. And I would really like for her to speak about the requirements in New York State as opposed to New York City because they are two separate entities. And what I would like to see, we need to bridge a gap and have one set of rules. And I'm not saying that one is more quality than other, but there is a really bridge to New York State between certifications and operating programs. Yeah, hi, Carolyn and everyone. Um, sure, I think you've said it exactly right. You know, the fact that New York City folks that are doing early Head Start, so it's the same as the rest of the state outside of New York City, but yet they have to, in New York City, be teacher certified birth to age two, to grade two. So that is an extremely challenging thing. Outside of the city, it's just the daycare regulations that are much less strict than the Head Start regulations. So we're okay in the Head Start world. You know, they, they follow what Head Start says and that makes them qualified for both Head Start or Early Head Start and also the childcare rules and, and regulations that they have to follow. So we have two different sets of regulations like Carolyn was saying for childcare, center-based childcare. And it does make it complicated and expensive for folks to go to school to in the city, especially to get uh, certified. Uh, getting their master's degree and teacher certification to then get paid at the rate of a child care provider. So it's it, as if it wasn't hard enough before, it's even harder now. And, um, you know, I don't know if we'll ever get to the place where the rest, I mean, if anything, they'd say they'd raise the rest of the state and then we'd be, so somewhere we have to meet in the middle. Maybe Head Start has it figured out where we have people who have the qualifications and we have folks that have had the experience that get the CDA, which is very hands-on, which is very, uh, appropriate for the age group that they are serving versus getting a master's degree in most coursework is offered at the, the K to second grade level, and then they go teach in a two-year-old classroom. So we're very dis, you know, disjointed, I would say, um, and they know it you know, at the state. Um, they don't seem to see it as a top priority, but we are definitely working on that. And um, you know, the association and myself and a lot of other people to try to make things connect in a way that makes more sense. Thank you, Patty. And um, that's really that hard, deep work of alignment in states and why these agendas, I think, are so important. Um, I want to ask a question, final question to all our panelists, actually around, um, I know there's other movements in your state, big initiatives that your governor may be supporting or others. Simeon, I'm going to go to you first, because, uh, you know, we're here talking as a community about Early Head Start, why it's so great. But I actually feel like it really fits with a lot of the movements we see in states already. The Kerwin Commission is a big deal in Maryland. How do you see high quality infant toddler care uh, fitting into the goals or the mission of the Kerwin Commission, if you had to explain, explain on that? Yeah, so it's actually called the Blueprint for Maryland's Future. Okay. The actual title. And it, 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 it covers education from infant and toddlers up to college right and it's a huge bill that um is believed it is going to reshape education in the state of maryland um you know obviously one area of that bill is universal pre-k uh, for the state of maryland and that's something that we're grappling with uh, at the moment and the way that it could possibly impact programs 
there may be some Head Start programs that look and say, you know what, early Head Start is where we need to be because the universal pre-K program may in some, especially rural areas and, and uh, neighborhoods that uh, just don't have that many children and families, families may choose, hey, I'm going to go to uh, the universal pre-K program in school and that Head Start program may decide, well, it's better for, for us to work with early Head Start. Uh, of course, this is not what we want to happen at the moment, but it is a possibility in the future. Uh, so this is where we believe programs may be able to braid funding with uh, the Blueprint for Maryland's future, as well as federal money and other state monies that might become available uh, to ensure that those Head Start programs remain viable in their communities. That's great. And obviously also one of the striking things about early Head Start that parents tell us is how their child developed, how their child uh, numbers, letters, stayed on track, got ready for school, even at that super early age, anyone who's had a young child knows the rate of development with support can be just tremendous. Um, so any educational goals Marilyn wants to meet, early Head Start's well positioned for sure, as well as Head Start, right, to provide that prenatal to five continuum. Uh, and NHSA is also a vocal supporter for that full continuum of Head Start, early Head Start, because we know the evidence shows the longer you have that child in Head Start, high quality Head Start, the better off they're going to be uh, in life and in school. Uh, Bonnie and, and, and Suzanne, you can chime in. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off, but this is the reason why we really are forging a trying to strong, forge a strong relationship with our child care and family child care programs to build those early child care partnerships. Uh, you know, you know, in, in forging that relationship, I mean, we, we attend their conferences, they attend our conferences, we help each other, uh, you know, to develop agendas, you know, so that we can really build uh, that partnership and make it strong, because we know uh, that the blueprint for Maryland future uh, is coming down the pike within a couple of years. And, you know, we've got to work together, it's, it's going to be a mixed delivery system, that's what's proposed. Yeah at the moment um but you know there's going to be a lot of coordination that needs to go on to ensure that head start family child care child care etc remains viable yeah. you know within those communities so you know we're really developing and working on that relationship and early head start is part of building that partnership thank you well i want to turn to bonnie and also suzanne um it's amazing timing later today the first lady of new jersey is actually going to be talking about Early Head Start. Um, she's got a major initiative, I think, called Nurture. Um, Bonnie, do you want to share a little bit about Nurture and how the goals of, how Early Head Start, frankly, is directly mentioned, weaved into that? What are the goals of that? Um, can you share with the crew here? Sure. The First Lady adopted as her initiative early on uh, in uh, uh, Governor Murphy's administration as the First Lady, um, taking on um, maternal child health, uh, as well as infant mortality, uh, the overall well-being being of infants and toddlers, as well as, as young families. Uh, there have been family festivals to connect families with a variety of resources. Uh, she's been a champion for pushing forward with uh, getting more doulas certified in the state. Um, and actually, uh, Suzanne was instrumental in getting that um, uh, presentation this afternoon up and running because I'll actually be on that panel today okay. um, and uh, I'll be bringing with me uh, one of our certified doulas uh, for our early head start program um, as well as some staff from the uh, leaguers early head start program to talk about the importance of early head start and how we really um, provide that foundation for uh, good child outcomes for children in the state. And Suzanne, I don't know if you've been working very closely with the First Lady's office, if you want to add more. Um, no, I think you said it all. Um, she, uh, I am on her leadership team um, for the infant and toddler um, and for NJ Nurture. Um, she's um, uh, for the governor's uh, State of the Union speech. 
yesterday, he's put 15 million in to raise Medicare rates, uh, for 17 million to develop a universal um, newborn home visitation, um, to develop 100,000 for stillbirth um, and for uh, facilities for midwife and, uh, to in, and also 2.1 million for case management for intake hubs and um, and uh, so and campaign and we're putting at least 500,000 in campaigning about the importance of infant and toddler care. Um, so Head Start will be in, intertwined into that. Um, and so she's uh, really, really um, helping uh, to get early Head Start known in the state of New Jersey. So stay tuned. I may be able to get to see if she could push for some more uh, dollars to expand Early Head Start because I did share with her the waiting list of the number of infant and toddler slots that are waiting to get into Head Start, which is huge. So um, stay tuned. And for those who are advocating, Suzanne, thank you for spotlighting that data, which is uh, unfortunate data, but also shows the need, shows the demand parents need early Head Start. Um, Carolyn, I'm not sure if the, if early Head Start you feel like fits in with any state initiatives. I will note, I mean, we'll note uh, uh, Mayor de Blasio put a huge focus on universal pre-K. Maybe we can get Mayor Adams to <laughs> expand that to universal infant toddler care. Curious what you're seeing either in the city or the state any alignment with kind of the bigger goals of politicians and, and whatnot? Okay, I, um, for, for New York State, the um, New York State Early Childhood Advisory Council, um, that's one of our agenda is to work with Early Head Start and the workforce. And we do have our co-chair present and Patty might want to further say something about that on the state level. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Carolyn. Thank you. And Carolyn's also a member of the Early Childhood Advisory Council as well. Um, so it's a big piece of it using the Early Head Start Child Care Partnership model as the example of what we need to be doing in New York. And, um, and also related to that right now in New York, um, in the legislature, there are two bills, um, two proposed pieces of legislation that um, want to see something along the lines of universal child care. So mm -hmm. people up to some 200 or 250% of poverty, something like that. And so of course, those of us who have any say at all are trying to make people listen to the fact that the Early Head Start Child Care Partnership model has been really a game changer for child care, where we've got a lot in New York, but not enough. And so if we could expand that, if, if we do get some sort of universal child care, that mm -hmm. would be the way to go to make sure mm -hmm. the the children and families most in need are getting the diapers and the supportive services and all of the pieces that really can change their lives. And, um, you know, so it could be the perfect time, like the perfect storm, things are going sort yeah. of so badly. And then these things come along that um, we could seize the moment. Yeah. I did also do some research recently to see if um, New York could even be a sponsor to, to have state early head start. And right now we don't have the authority to do so. So we would have to change some laws to do that. Um, so maybe that's something else we put on our agenda to mm -hmm. accomplish in the near future. I'm saying it now so that it makes it real. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Patty, for all your hard work, research, advocacy um, within the state. So appreciate that. Um, I want to end uh, with a question, right? So you've got these three great agendas. Final question for the panel. Um, let's go to Simeon first, back to Simeon. Who do you want to read this, right? Who do you really want to get this into the hands of um, and have a conversation with? Just give our folks a sense of that as they might be embarking on their own endeavor. Yeah, uh, you know, our goal is to, number one, get this in the hand of legislators, right? Um, so if they can understand the breadth of Early Head Start, the way it impacts communities around the state and the need for expansion. Uh, and then, of course, we want to spread the message and, and bring awareness to Early Head Start to everyone across the state. So our other partners, you know, child care, you know, there are child care programs that are just not aware, <clears throat> excuse me, of Early Head Start and sometimes even Head Start, which is one of the reasons why we continuously attend 
um, you know, their conferences or uh, other events that they may have so that we can educate them about Head Start. You know, so we want our partners to understand. And then, of course, the state, you know, so that we can have those tough conversations on how we can, uh, you know, expand Early Head Start and how they can help us provide the funding to do so. Thank you. Bonnie, how about your agenda? So I, I think what uh, New Jersey will be doing is very similar to what Simeon mentioned, which is that uh, we will be sharing this agenda with various state legislators, with the governor's office. Suzanne will be sharing it with her leadership group, uh, with the first lady, uh, as well as the Department of Education. We'll be sharing it with other advocates throughout the state, um, as well as our directors to help them um, have uh, that five minute elevator speech that they need to advocate for uh, early Head Start and um, the well being of infants and toddlers in the state of New Jersey. Thank you so much. And Carolyn, want to wrap with you. How about in New York? All right. I won't repeat what my two colleagues have stated. So, um, Mr. Russell and Ms. Ettenberg, I concur with them, and New York State will be doing. Um, exactly um, what they have outlined as far as sharing um, this information to all of our stakeholders throughout the state. Wonderful. Well, it looks like there's a lot of uh, avenues for that in each of your states. And I hope other folks on the call thinking about this for their state. See, there is an audience who wants to see this receptive to it and opportunities to engage uh, with them. So we went a little over time. I want to thank, again, everyone who joined today, but also especially um, our speakers today, uh, Carolyn, Suzanne, Simeon, Bonnie, uh, Patty. I think I captured everybody. If not, apologies. Um, thank you for representing your states and the views uh, of these policy agendas. We've gone ahead and put those links in again for folks so they can read and download your policy agendas and look at them. And my colleague, Lucy, is going to put another uh, link in here. There's something easy you can do today. Spread the good word about early Head Start. So we're going to put a link in here and Lucy, feel free to pull it up to a nice little graphic we've got on social media uh, about how powerful early Head Start can be for young children and families. We'll go ahead and put that in there. You can see that there on Twitter and we'll put the Facebook in as well. I hope you can share that out. Just take a minute here to do that as we wrap up. Um, raising awareness of this model and what it can do is one of our fundamental goals with Early Head Start Rising. We absolutely feel like if people are much more aware of it, um, then we get into the conversation about the how, the how to do it, for whom to do it, et cetera. But we've got to get over that first hurdle of awareness too. So please go ahead and tweet that out or share that out on Facebook, Lucy, if we have a link there. Um, and just again, thank you all for being here today. Look for more state policy agendas uh, in partnership with other state associations around Early Head Start. We wanna to continue to rise this movement to expand access to more kids. 11% of kids can access Early Head Start. That's unacceptable, we need that to rise. Thank you for your support today and have a great rest of your day and great rest of your week. Take care.